Welcome back to Doomsday Clock, right here at Comic Storium, your home for audio dramas of your favorite video games, movies, and of course, comic books. We've been covering a series known as Doomsday Clock here, which is a continuation of the original Watchmen storyline if they were to be merged with the DC Universe. Our hero, Ozymandias, has gone to the DC Universe with Maimon, Marionette, and a new Rorschach in an attempt to find Dr. Manhattan so that he can hopefully save the original Watchmen universe, only to discover that he has no intentions of going home. He's going to stay here and figure out what he came to do. This has now led Ozymandias that he will take actions into his own hands, and he will save not only the Watchmen universe, but the DC universe. While this has been happening, the DC Universe has been dealing with the Superman theory. A theory that the government has created every superhero and therefore they cannot be trusted. Now, let's continue our tale. Busbastus yawns, his mouth stretching wide, as he sits on the floor of the Oval Office. The seal of the President of the United States beneath him. Behind him, bathed in moonlight that floods through the windows, Adrian Veet holds up the file that he was looking for. Yes, yes, this one will do nicely, he whispers to himself. Back at the Daily Planet, Lois and Clark stand talking to Perry White as he leans out of his office, yelling for Lois to finish a story that she owes him. I'm working on it, Chief, she promises. And when she turns back to her desk, she finds an envelope addressed to her with no return. She reaches forward, curiosity overcoming her. Breaking news from Moscow! The news suddenly blares behind her, bringing everyone's attention to the TV. And Clark comes over, putting his arm around his wife as they watch the events unfolding. The reporters confirm that the nuclear hero, known as Firestorm, has invaded Russia when the country began to round up citizens that they believed had a metagene. Speculation that he is connected to the Superman theory continues, although Firestorm has intensely denied the accusations. The reporter states, and Lois looks at her husband, questioning him. Firestorm wasn't created by some secret government program, Lois, Clark tells her. Ronnie Raymond and Martin Stein were in a nuclear accident that fused them together. Ronnie is in control of the body while the professor advises him telepathically. Ronnie is just a kid known for his temper. The news continues to show the fight as Perry leans out of his office again, screaming who wants to go to Russia, and both Lois and Clark raise their hands. Meanwhile, over in Moscow, Firestorm and Pazar trade their blasts of fiery energy with Pazar's teammates lashing out, eventually bringing the nuclear hero to the ground. With his fire extinguished, Firestorm drops into the Russian crowd below, hands reaching for him as the crowd lashes out. And Ronnie begins to scream, Let go of me! His fire ignites, it begins to blast over the crowd. And when the flames recede, Ronnie stands, looking out at the crowd of people that have turned to glass around him. He stares, fear and sorrow on his face. My, my God, uh, what did I do? I, I didn't mean to. He disappears into the air, disappearing into a blaze of fire. But back at the bugle, the reporters all stare at the news report. Did, did he kill those people? Jimmy asks, stunned. It can't be what it looks like. Can it, Clark? Lois asks, and when she looks back behind her, Clark is gone in a gust of wind. And with a whoosh, Everyone sees Superman streak past the window headed out of the country. But Superman doesn't head to Moscow, and in the capital of Kondok, the hero known as the Creeper looks up from handing a child an apple. A bird, a plane, a Superman! He chuckles as the Man of Steel lands nearby, offering him a wave. Superman looks up as Giganta steps up to him, and the two nod at each other, with the supervillain leading the Man of Steel to their leader's throne. Hello, Superman! Black Adam calls, sitting on his throne, leaning on his arm. He stands, stalking across the room to stand before Superman. A moment passes and the ruler extends his arm, offering it. Welcome to Kondok. The two shake their hands, with Black Adam leading Superman around the castle, showing him that the metahumans and the humans both live there peacefully, hero and villain alike. And Kondok, all are welcome, Black Adam tells him. Even Firestorm? That is why you're here, is it not? But Black Adam tells him that Firestorm has not come to Kondok despite what the rumors state, and the two share a conversation, where Superman tells Adam to make sure that he doesn't try to cross any borders to take the law into his own hands. When you find Firestorm, tell him that he's welcome in Kondok. Black Adam tells him, and with their conversation complete, Superman turns and flies away. But later, Lois sits at her desk at the planet, talking to Clark on the phone. 
The two believe that Ronnie never left Russia and Clark hangs up, with Lois telling him to be careful. She turns once again, noticing the envelope with her name on it, and she reaches inside to discover a flash drive. Who sent me this? She asks, plugging it into the computer. Company presents American News! The loud voice narrates as a World War II newsreel begins to play. It's April 2nd, 1941! As the war rages overseas, back home there's trouble. Saboteurs! Spies! Fascists! The voice calls out. Lois leads forward, trying to figure out what this is. Images of teams of superheroes flash across the screen. And only the Justice Society of America can stop them! Lois leans closer, not recognizing any of those superheroes. Who the hell is the Justice Society of America? She questions. Meanwhile, Superman lands in the dark city of Chernobyl. He stops, listening closely, hearing the voice of Firestorm coming out of one of the abandoned buildings. Inside, he finds Firestorm lashing out with his atomic energies. Come on, please! He cries as Superman steps into the room, seeing one of the small children that Ronnie turned to glass. You have to show me how to do it, Professor! Tell me how to do it! Ronnie pleads, falling to his knees. Superman comes up behind the young man, trying not to startle him. What happened, Ronnie? He asks softly. He puts his hand on the man's shoulder, assuring him that he doesn't want a fight. I'm not here to hurt you. What happened to those people? He asks, nodding towards the glass child. Tears fill Ronnie's eyes as he explains that he's only ever been able to transform elements, nothing organic. You're trying to bring the boy back. Superman nods, and Ronnie follows up, nodding with him, telling him the Stein doesn't think it's possible. You did it once, Ronnie. Maybe it was an accident or a trigger through stress. Maybe your powers are evolving. I don't know, but you did it. You can do it again. Ronnie nods, promising to try again. He warns Superman that he should leave, that he might detonate if he's unstable, and Superman smiles, putting his hand on the man's shoulder as he moves to step behind him. I'm not leaving. I'll be fine, Ronnie. Ronnie nods preparing himself, and he blasts out, hitting the glass child with all of his energy. He pours it on with a blast he's thrown backwards, smoking. And the room clears, and the small child looks up at them, and Superman smiles at him. Superman? Privat. The Man of Steel greets him, waving. We did it! Firestorm cheers from the floor, smiling and crying. Superman picks up the boy, assuring Firestorm that he is okay. Everyone else in Moscow will be as well. It's going to be all right, Ronnie, he assures him. Tears fill the young man's eyes. Thank you, Superman, he smiles. Near the site of the incident in Russia, Vladimir Putin has called together a press conference. He confirms that Firestorm's act of aggression against the Russian people is seen as an act of war by an American agent, says the man is known to be part of the Superman theory. We are at war, Putin confirms. I was hoping I could convince you otherwise, sir. Superman calls, descending from above. Welcome, Superman. Thank you for coming. I assume you are here to help. Putin greets him. Superman confirms that he is, and he steps onto the podium. As Superman addresses the crowd, he asks that they try not to demonize the metahuman population, and that the Superman theory is nothing more than a giant lie. On his way to Moscow, Batman is listening to the broadcast, and he flicks a switch, sending a signal that only Clark can hear. Clark, it's Bruce. You need to stop talking. Keep your mouth shut. Don't pick a side. Back on stage, Putin steps forward, demanding that Superman stop. I have proof! Firestorm is an American agent, Superman. This was an attack against the people of Russia, he tells the Man of Steel. But Superman tries to explain that Firestorm can change the people back. But he's interrupted as Ronnie suddenly lands amongst the people. Everyone begins to scatter in fear as the military moves in, and no one notices the young boy in Firestorm's arms as the soldiers aim their weapons. Superman moves fast, suddenly appearing in front of the boy, blocking the bullets. The rounds ricochet, shattering the people that have turned to glass. No, you're killing them! Ronnie screams, lashing out against the soldiers with his energy. The heroes leap in with Pozar attacking Firestorm. The rest of his team move in on Superman, trying to stop him. Please, I can make this right! Firestorm begs as he struggles with the Pozar. The tanks begin to rumble in, rolling over the glass statues. As Superman sees this, anger filling him, and he throws the other heroes off of him. He flashes forward, throwing his shoulder into the tank, knocking it backwards. Firestorm falls amongst the destroyed statues. Tears are in his eyes. No! No, I can fix this! He cries as he holds up the pieces of the statue that was once human. Why wouldn't you listen? He screams, his nuclear fire flaring. 
Superman moves forward, reaching a hand out to the young hero when he hears Bruce's voice in his ears again. Superman, listen to me. The energy readings are spiking. Don't lose control, Ronnie, Superman tells the young man, putting his hand on his shoulder. Ronnie closes his eyes. The energy dissipates. I'm, I'm okay, he breathes. Superman suddenly pauses as he hears Bruce's voice in his ear. He is screaming, it's not Firestorm! The blue light flashes around them, destroying everything. The blast hits the bat wing, shattering the cockpit. And from his command center, Adrian Veet is watching the events unfold on the news. And he smiles. It begins. A gold ring floats through space, droplets of blood sticking to the cold vacuum. In the future, Dr. Manhattan sees a young legionnaire give his life to save the Earth's sun. The explosion sends the ring back and Manhattan looks at it in his hands. Something is wrong though. Time is fluid. Manhattan cocks his head to the side. It is July 1940 and he moves the Green Lantern six inches away from Alan Scott, seconds before his accident. He looks down at the ring in his hand, but it is gone. It was never there. He looks again into the future and sees nothing but darkness. One week from now, he sees nothing. The last image he sees is of Superman angrily charging at him. Does Superman destroy me or do I destroy everything? He asks himself. Several ships draw closer as the entirety of the Justice League and their allies close in on Mars. It is here that they have tracked the energy signature that caused the destruction of Moscow. John looks up into space from the surface of Mars. Five days ago, a tachyon fog on Earth obscured his vision to see into the past and the future. The fog has begun to fade and John can once again see into the past. He sees the destruction of Moscow. The heroes gathering, Batman and Superman, he sees the Earth turning against the Man of Steel, gathering outside the Hall of Justice to protest his involvement in Russia. Inside, Lois runs to her husband, who still lays unconscious from the blast. At Wayne Manor, Alfred turns to find Bruce coming and struggling up from his bed despite his wounds. What's going on? Where's Clark? Alfred tries to push the man back to his bed to no avail. He's recovering, secured in the Hall of Justice, Alfred assures him, and Firestorm. The young man awakens on one of the Justice League ships, startled to find Professor Stein sitting next to him. In the manor, though, Bruce is stalking through the house, headed for the Batcave, while Alfred explains why the entire League left the planet to travel to Mars. They discovered that it wasn't Firestorm who caused the explosion. It was someone else. Someone that they believe is trying to kill Superman. Bruce rips off the last of his bandages as he sits at his computer. They're being played. Firestorm wasn't behind the explosions, but I don't know if the man that they're going after was either. I should have listened. I didn't see it. He whispers, looking at the mask of Rorschach. On Mars, the ships begin to land and the heroes gather, staring out into the wasteland of Mars, seeing a palace in the distance. Kinda creepy, isn't it? Guy Gardner notes. So still, so pretty. Back on Earth, Lois stands over her recovering husband when suddenly a voice calls out in the darkened room. Hello, Lois. Did you get the drive that I sent you? Lex Luthor asks from the doorway. Lois turns, anger flashing in her eyes as she shouts at Lex. I don't know how you got here, Lex, but if you've come to finish Superman off, it'll be over my dead body. I have no intention of harming Superman at this moment, Lex assures her, stepping into the room. Meanwhile, back on Mars, the lanterns have sealed the planet in a green orb, and the heroes move forward, with Martian Manhunter taking lead. Hello, my name is Jean Jans. Who are you? Where do you come from? What are you doing on Mars? He asks as the heroes begin to encircle Dr. Manhattan, who barely seems to notice them. They're protesting a power that they fear, Dr. Manhattan states, still not looking at any of the heroes. A moment passes and he finally turns to Martian Manhunter. Excuse me, I was talking to Robbie Raymond six minutes from now. The tachyons are muddling up things. You're here looking for answers you don't know the questions to. Guy Gardner steps forward, looking around at the gathering of heroes. Shocker! The guy's a lunatic! But Jean tells him to stop. He tries to once again speak to Dr. Manhattan. Dr. Manhattan turns back to the Martian. From your mind, I can see that you're confused. Dr. Manhattan turns back to Martian Manhunter. Only for the moment, in five seconds, you will broadcast to everyone's thoughts that you read most clearly my final vision of Superman. The image flashes in everyone's mind and Supergirl is overcome with anger. You think that he's going to destroy you so you're coming out to destroy him first? She demands. Guy steps forward, leaping into the air, his ring flashing. That's enough! Talk is over! Let's put some underwear on this guy. 
The energy strengthens his punch, and the blow nearly twists Dr. Manhattan's head all around, a dull crack echoing throughout the fields of Mars as the man falls to the ground. Christ! I didn't mean to kill him outright! Guy starts to explain, a smile on his face, but he's interrupted as Dr. Manhattan suddenly disappears. Where'd he go? Guy asks, looking around, when suddenly a voice speaks from over his shoulder. That ring, I'm curious, what's inside it? Dr. Manhattan, now completely healed, asks as he reaches out his touch sending sparks of energy and pain through Guy Gardner's body. He pulls the ring from Guy's finger, dropping the now powerless man to the ground. I must admit, not knowing what is and was and will be, it's enjoyable. Dr. Manhattan notices as he holds up the energy ring. The ring shatters in his hand, drifting into the air in a haze of green smoke and sparkles. This energy, emotion, coalesced, manufactured in a power by the ring. He stares at the remnants of the Green Lantern energy. I find it difficult to affect. John Constantine orders the magic users to attack, and Etrogen leaps in, breathing fire, while Zatanna attacks with a blast of magical energy. Magic is swirling around Dr. Manhattan. You all believe that you are wielding magic. He holds out his hand, and the energy condenses into a ball. I see this power that you harness is really the scraps of creation, like random errors in computer code, discarded and forgotten left to be picked up and used by those who have also been discarded and forgotten. The heroes begin to move in for the attack, but the ball of magic expands rapidly, throwing them all away. It feels good to still learn. Dr. Manhattan smiles. Back at the Hall of Justice, Lex steps forward, telling Lois that he comes in peace, but Lois knows that Lex has spent his life trying to destroy the Man of Steel. Why would I believe a word that you say? Lex just smiles. He's excited to see Superman taken down a peg and he understands her caution. Reaching into his pocket, he pulls out a pistol, offering it to her. Take it if it makes things better. Lois nods, taking the weapon, aiming it at Lex, gritting her teeth. Don't take a step closer to Superman, she warns. Lex just nods. I was the one who sent you the footage of those heroes that never were. It's proof, Lois. Proof that there is a force out there that is undermining not only Superman, but all of creation. On Mars, our heroes have pressed their attack, lightning crackling along the Marvel family, throwing them to the ground. Starfire leaps in, but her energy blasts are turned aside. The Doom Patrol is thrown as if they mean nothing. Firestorm sails past, aiming his power towards Dr. Manhattan. We can't hold back, Professor. We don't know what we're dealing with. He shouts, but Dr. Manhattan looks up, nodding and extending his finger. No, Ronald, you don't. In a flash of blue energy, Firestorm is once again in the lab where the accident that gave him powers took place. Dr. Manhattan stands by the window looking out on those who are protesting the experiment. They're protesting the power that they fear, he tells Robbie. And Robbie stands there not knowing what is happening. He asks where is Professor Stein and Dr. Manhattan merely points at the door. Robbie steps forward leaning and discovering Stein on the phone. His eyes widen in shock as he overhears Stein discussing the accident, how he believes that it's going to fuse them together. What better way to learn more about these metahumans than from the inside? Dr. Manhattan asks, and Robbie steps back shocked. Back on Mars, Firestorm flails in the air, lashing out in anger at Dr. Manhattan, the nuclear energy knocking them to the ground. The other heroes see this and they begin to press their attacks. Energy attacks from the heroes begin to drive Dr. Manhattan to his knees until finally he turns his head, seeing Captain Adam stepping forward. Get clear, he orders the other heroes. Forget Superman. Captain Adam is the last thing you're ever going to see. He shouts, hitting Manhattan with everything he has. Energy begins to rip out of Dr. Manhattan as a look of shock comes over his face. He explodes, sending the heroes flying as his palace is torn apart. Slowly, the smoke of destruction begins to clear, and the heroes pull themselves to their feet, with Dr. Manhattan seemingly defeated. They turn, though, as a soft blue light begins to glow. Veins and tendons begin to appear and are quickly covered as muscles and skin grow over them. And in mere moments, Dr. Manhattan stands before them once again. What were you hoping to accomplish? He asks, his blue light beginning to expand, filling the space all around them until they disappear at a harsh light. Back on Earth? Adrian Veet sits by his bank of monitors watching as Wonder Woman steps before the United Nations in order to give a speech. Our world is under assault by mistruths, fear, and extremism. There's no singular villain behind it. We've all played a role. Suddenly, the wall behind her explodes inward. Hope I'm not interrupting, Diana, Black Adam calls, with Giganta and Creeper behind him. I heard your friends were on vacation. 
And the saga of Doomsday Clock concludes there for today. Now make sure you subscribe to the channel as at this point we're going to be bringing you Doomsday Clock every day until we get to the completion. Do you want to see the inevitable battle between Superman and Dr. Manhattan? Do you want to see where this is going to go? Then subscribing and turning on that notification bell will definitely help you with that goal. You can also check the banner up above to get a rough idea of what our schedule is. We try our best to keep to that. And uh, otherwise you can chat with me over on Twitter about what you're thinking about the storyline. Next up is going to be chapters 10 and 11 and then we're going to bring you the finale on the day it comes out. I hope you guys have enjoyed this up to this point. In my opinion, having read these all back to back and not reading them two months apart, this is an incredible story, and I'm loving telling the story to you guys in this fashion. A lot of people wondered why it took me so long to actually get to the Doomsday Clock. Simply put, after issue three, kind of had a clear idea that this was going to make a better trade. I hate stating trade waiting, but I feel like this is kind of meant to be read in that manner. And because of that, I waited until we got near the ending so that you guys wouldn't have gaps of me reading through the storyline. So here it is, the story finally coming out here on the channel. I hope you're enjoying it. I'll see you guys next time right here at Comic Story.